town because the church elders have uh, discovered her bathing quite innocently in a river uh, near her cabin, and uh, she's now become the object of uh, all kinds of nasty talk in the, in the little village, and she asks her brother Sam, why do people behave that way? I mean, this is his response to her. All right. Jerry Hadley, Joshua Green at the piano here on WNYC-FM. Our guest, Jerry Hadley, with pianist Joshua Green. Music from Carlisle Floyd's Susanna. It's about the way people is made. And uh, it is opening March 31st and runs through the end of April at the Met with That's Jerry, right. Jerry Hadley, among many other yeah, distinguished and it's, artists. Uh, if, if you've not heard Susanna, it really is one of the great gems of the American opera repertoire. There's actually a lot of gems of American opera that don't get much of a hearing anymore because... Um, well, I think the, the predilection of the opera going public and of opera presenters is to, you know, go with the surefire things that have been proven time and time and time again. What's ironic is that uh, since the middle of the 19th century until now, I think there must have been something like 1,500 American operas written, and many of them actually commissioned by the Met uh, from the late... Uh, 1890s on through the 30s and, and 40s. Um, we've seen some other things commissioned by them since, like uh, Antony and Cleopatra and, and what have you, but they're wonderful, wonderful works that in many cases have only had the, the, the uh, uh, advantage of just an initial run of performances and then never any subsequent Well, the other thing that's ironic is that the conventional wisdom is that opera is having a huge renaissance and that uh, many composers of new music uh, are attracted to opera as a form now, as a way of... Uh, yeah, but you know what I think the problem is, and I don't think anybody can necessarily be faulted for this, it's just the way it is. Operas that are written today very rarely get subsequent performances beyond the premiere. The premiere is, is the thing which garners the publicity and garners the notoriety for whatever opera company happens to be presenting it. And in very rare cases, do you see operas, new operas, afforded the luxury that even a mediocre Broadway show is, is afforded, which is to give the composer a chance to see it on stage once and to have someone take uh, an entrepreneurial and uh, uh, artistic risk and say, you know, this show could be even better if we mount it again and fix the things that didn't quite work this time. Um, I think it's changing, but it's changing 
awfully slowly, and it's too bad because there's so many wonderful people out there writing today. Jerry Hadley is our guest here on WNYC FM in our performance studio, talking and singing too. Um, you're very passionate about American music, uh, I know. I well, mean, you know, it's nice it, to be doing something you're so passionate about. <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, I, I, I've always been an American history fanatic. Um, um, it's kind of an obsession with me. I, I mean, just whenever, regular old, not musical history, but just no, regular, but regular American, American history. history. And what's so fascinating to me is that you can see that history and the emerging, the emergence of the American psyche reflected in all the works that people have written in this country since native-born and immigrant composers started to write and search for an American voice. Um, I mean, in the 19th century, there were a lot of other, other composers other than Stephen Foster <laughs> that were writing. And, you know, between Stephen Foster and Charles Griffiths, there were a whole group of people that were trying their damnedest to find a way to uh, take the, the European traditions and translate those into a truly American idiom in the same way that uh, all of our other institutions and, and cultural uh, currents come from come from Europe for the most part and um, I think that for me it was just kind of a natural progression because when I was a student I was very fortunate to have as my uh, if you will my opera teacher David Lloyd who uh, recently the head of the Sullivan Foundation well David at that time in the mid 70s was not only the head of the opera program at the University of Illinois, but also the general manager of the Lake George Opera Festival. And David was a huge, huge champion of American opera, and uh, it was through David that I was introduced to, uh, to, the, whole, to the whole body of, of American opera works. I, I know that he was responsible as general director of Lake George for bringing things like... Um, well, a lot of the Minotti operas, of course, but uh, Thomas Passacheri's Black Widow was performed there. There was an operatic setting of The Last of the Mohicans done up there in 1977, right. I think. Uh, Summer and Smoke by Lee Hoiby, which is a phenomenal piece. Um, and The Crucible, the list goes on and on and on. And over the years, what started out as kind of a, I don't know, a hobby, a footnote hobby, became a real passion for me as I started to discover what was out there. And I, if people really knew what was there, they would be astounded at how good these pieces are. Well, but it sounds to me as if you're going to be doing something about bringing some of that material well, to the Well, hopefully, yes. I, I, along with some other um, uh, concerned people from a broad discipline of, um, of uh, the spectrum of the, of the American music scene, have just formed an organization called the American Lyric Theater Association. Now, we are incredibly embryonic at the moment, and we've only just begun the uh, process of uh, going out and raising funds and everything, but what we hope we're going to be doing over the next 10 or 15 years is presenting some of these works mm -hmm. with first-rate casts and uh, first-rate orchestras and things like that in concert as a beginning to, uh, to try to bring some of these things back. And... Um, uh, I hope you're going to be hearing more about the American Lyric Theater Association I in the so months too. and years to come. Jerry Hadley is our guest here at WNYC-FM, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> let's uh, hear a little bit about what you're going to sing for us now in this next little set. Um, well, I, I suppose that uh, when you talk about American music, it, it, it sort of goes without saying that you have to say Aaron Copland. <laughs> and uh, Aaron Copland wrote two operas of note, the second Hurricane, which he wrote, I think, in 1938, and The Tender Land, which he wrote in the mid-50s. The Tender Land is a story which takes place in the Midwest during the Great Depression in the Dust Bowl. Um, and it's the uh, rather bittersweet love story of a drifter farmhand, Martin, and a girl, high school girl named Lori, who is the daughter of the man for whom Martin works. The aria that I'm going to sing for you from The Tender Land is the moment at which the drifter realizes that he's in love and um, in a very awkward but ultimately quite poetic way Martin expresses to Laurie uh, 
his his dreams and his aspirations and uh, his hope that they can have a life together. It's called I, the title of the aria is I'm getting tired of traveling through. All right, this is music of Copeland, and Jerry Hadley is our guest with Joshua Green at the piano here on WNYC FM. <laughs> graduated and like your ma says you won't be nervous anymore Lori you know Lori I'm getting tired of travel My shoes are wearing thin. I'm getting tired of wandering, wandering, not caring where I've been. I want to stay in a place for. Jerry Hadley, our guest here at WNYC-FM, Joshua Green at the piano, music of Copeland. I'm getting tired of traveling through from the tender land. It's the American dream, all capsulized in one. Yeah, so much yearning in it. The yeah, and the whole piece is full of that. The, the, um, the music is, 
it's interesting because the piece has kind of had a, a a checkered history on stage, and and a lot of the critics who uh, were its I won't call them detractors, but it, the, the people who said you know the the inherent weakness of the tender land is that it's full of yearning that never quite gets fulfilled, but in fact, you know, that's what happened a lot in the depression is that is that you know people struck out to try to make things better and it worked out for some and it didn't work out for others and it's a great piece and it just it's full of moments like that jerry hadley in our studios here at wnyc fm you're going to sing two more songs for us before you go right uh next the homing heart right now this is not from a a, a stage work but uh it's 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 uh written by alfred i'm sorry albert hay malott who most people know as the composer of the perennial favorite at weddings, funerals, uh, not bar mitzvahs, <laughs> the Lord's Prayer, the famous Malat Lord's Prayer. What many people don't know is that in addition to his um, uh, sacred music, he wrote a number of really, really wonderful love songs uh, in the early part of this century. And uh, he's only one of a number of, of American composers of that period who... Uh, uh, wrote songs which I think for many people today are are full of a kind of a sentiment that while it may embarrass them um, <laughs> it never the, the songs never fail to elicit honest tears of joy <laughs> from an audience <laughs> and this is one of them it's called The Homing Heart All by right. Albert Hay Malott and it's Jerry Hadley with Joshua Green at the piano <laughs> Well, you called that one right. I am embarrassed, and I am tearing up. So. Jerry Hadley in the studios here. You know, I, it, what's so thing. interesting to me about the songs of that period is that there is this very, very direct appeal to things that everybody feels, but that we today are somehow, uh, we're, we're proud of our cynicism, and we're proud of our skepticism. And unfortunately, that's really not all of what human beings uh, consist and um, one cannot sing the music of well actually you know if you consider it that kind of of, of sentiment only became um, unfashionable after we exploded the atomic bomb since Hiroshima since Nagasaki it's harder for us to believe in the happy ending than it used to be and somehow a lot of the the things that that the information that we have today disallows us from having um, dreams and it disallows us from having heroes 
and things like that. Yet, nevertheless, our, our souls and our hearts cry out for that. And it's always interesting to me when, when one performs a song like that, the, the immediate response that it has to an audience, if one doesn't apologize for it while performing. I think the only thing that can, can lift us out of this is a little Vincent Yeomans, don't you? You think so? <laughs> I think so. Well, this <laughs> is uh, 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 a song from his show Great Day, which was ironically premiered in 1929, just a couple weeks before the stock market crashed. There are three songs that survive from this show as part of our common parlance. One of them is More Than You Know, More Than You Know. The other one, which kind of became a an, unwill, an unwitting anthem for the depression was when you're down and out, lift up your head and shout, it's going to be a great day. And this one, which was popularized by the great American baritone Lawrence Tibbet. This is Jerry Hadley in our studios here at WNYC-FM, Joshua Green at the piano without a song. A song from the late 1920s, Without a Song. Jerry Hadley in our studios here. Joshua Green at the piano. It's WNYC-FM at 93.9. And I thank you so much. Oh, thank you. What a treat, as always, to have you here. <laughs> Aren't you nice? And thank you, Joshua, for making that piano sound like an orchestra. And thank you for filling our studio, literally. You're very with, welcome. With such splendid sound. Uh, Jerry Hadley uh, opens March 31st in Carlisle Floyd's Susanna. It's running through the end of April at the Met, and you're also going to be in uh, Harbison's Great Gatsby? Right. I get to create the role of the Great Gatsby in, uh, I think, opening night's December 20th, 1999. All right. And uh, it's a wonderful score. And again, a wonderful cast. James Levine's conducting. Dawn Upshaw is singing the role of Daisy. And um, after I've gone on my slimming diet, I'll be able to go into those performances wearing the white suit, and you know, and actually look like Gatsby. Splendid! We yeah. can't wait. Yeah. And we'll also look for more news of the American Lyric, Lyric Theater, Theater Association. Association. You'll be hearing more from us. Thank you both for coming. <laughs> 